On the brink of turmoil, Lebanon's Prime Minister quits, fearing he'd be assassinated as a power struggle intensifies between Saudi Arabia and Iran. So will Lebanon again become the battleground for other people's wars? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Now, Lebanon's Prime Minister Saad Hariri's resignation came as a surprise. The fact that he did it from Riyadh, accusing Iran and its Lebanese ally Hezbollah of sowing strife in the Arab world sent shockwaves through the region. I hereby announce my resignation as Prime Minister from the Lebanese government, knowing that the will of the Lebanese is stronger and their determination is steadfast and will overcome any attempts to impose any custodianship over them from powers either inside or outside our country. I would like to say to Iran and its followers that they will be losers in their intervention in the Arab affairs. Our nation will wake up as it did in the past and their hands in the region will be cut off. Now, a former Lebanese president, Elias Sarawi, once said, Lebanon has always been the battlefield of others' wars, and many fear that that could be happening again. Now, Hariri's resignation shatters a delicate deal that put him in a coalition government after a two-year political vacuum. It's not the first time a Le Lebanese government has collapsed. It happened in 2005, 2011 and 2013. The country's political structure requires that the president must be a Maronite Christian, the prime minister a Sunni Muslim, and the speaker of parliament a Shia Muslim. Last year, Lebanon's parliament swore in a new cabinet dominated by Hezbollah and its allies in a major victory for the Shia Iran-backed group. Add to that, Hezbollah's military wing has been racking up victories in Syria, building up its arsenal and steadily increasing its influence at home. And that's upset some, including Saudi Arabia. Right, let's introduce our guests now. Joining us on Skype from Beirut is Joseph Katitrian, a uh, political commentator and senior fellow at the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. From Tehran, we have Mustafa Koshesem, who is professor of journalism at the Applied Sciences University. And from Boston, we have Rami Khoury, senior public policy fellow and adjunct professor of journalism at the American University of Beirut. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Can I start with you, Joseph? Said Hariri said that conditions uh, that have prompted him to quit um, are similar to those in 2005, uh, just before his own father, uh, Rafiq Hariri, was assassinated. What would he be referring to? Well, he was being referring to the outside intervention. Obviously, Lebanon has always been the battleground for other people's wars. And in the post-2005 period, when everyone assumed that, in fact, there was a new kind of uh, stability that has been reached, uh, Unfortunately, the experience of the past decade or two has not been particularly positive. And he was referring to the fact that his own life was in danger, apparently. We don't know all the details that has been that have yet to be published, but apparently there was an assassination attempt on his life and he escaped at the last moment. Now, it remains to be determined, of course, whether this is just a facade or whether there were some serious political disputes between the different parties in the country, which is probably more likely, that eventually led him to make the decision that he has made. And uh, Mustafa in Tehran, um, he directly accused uh, Hezbollah of threatening the Lebanese people, and he accused Iran of trying to destroy the Arab world. I mean, it's a huge accusation, isn't it? Well, yes, of course, it's a huge accusation, and uh, it resembles the kind of tweets that Thamira Sabhan, the Saudi uh, minister for PGCC affairs, uh, just tweeted and released in his account, um, like uh, many other statements made by Saudi officials. And that was also another indication uh, that disclosed uh, that his uh, resignation has been requested or ordered by Saudi Arabia. We all know everyone, including proponents and uh, opponents of Hariri, everyone believes that his resignation would entail uh, economic security and political repercussions for the country. And uh, all groups agree also that uh, this was done at the request or ordered by Saudi Arabia. 
And there is a reason for that, why the Saudis have done that. Uh, I think I'll uh, you know, deal with it through the program. Uh, OK, uh, but also uh, a foreign ministry spokesman uh, from Tehran also directly attributed uh, Washington as being uh, in collusion with Saudi Arabia, as being behind this, the, the forcing of a Hariri uh, to quit. Oh, yes. Um, the point is that um, the grasp and the understanding here in Tehran is that uh, after the Saudis lost their war of militancy initiative uh, that was started uh, by them and their allies, including Israel and the United States in Syria and in Iraq, and after uh, they, they lost uh, uh, you know, their militants that they backed, uh, especially in eastern Syria, now uh, the Saudis, along with the United States, are working on a scheme in order to use their other cards in the region. That entails economic and political leverage. That means uh, using petrodollars in Iraq in order to gather influence to steer some uh, you know, differences among Shiite groups in there. And we, we, also we've, we've the, uh, putting some gist. leverage on his Sorry, Hezbollah. we've got the gist of, of your theory there. Let's go to Rami Khoury now in Boston, because we are moving away already. We're moving away from the brass tacks of what's going on in Beirut. And Rami, what's your assessment of the situation and what happens next? Uh, there's, there's no prime minister. Does that mean the end of this coalition government? Well, it, it does. Um, they'll, be a, they'll stay as a caretaker government, but whether there is a government or isn't a government, or is a president or isn't a president, as Lebanon has experienced in recent years, ultimately doesn't make a huge amount of difference for the reality of political balance of power uh, in the country. We've just been through a period over the last year or so when we had a president, we had a prime minister, we had a functioning parliament. The cabinet started making big decisions on parliament also on election laws, gas uh, agreements, uh, elections coming up, uh, all kinds of taxation systems. So these were major moves for the Lebanese system, which has been pretty dysfunctional for many, many decades. So the, when the prime minister resigns like this in a dramatic fashion on television in Saudi Arabia, the signal is really about Saudi policy as much as it is about internal Lebanese affairs. But there will be a moment of uh, uh, confusion, concern, some turmoil politically, but the Lebanese will reassemble as they always do to uh, share the pie that is political incumbency in Lebanon. They've always done it and they'll do it again. The losers will be the ordinary people who will pay for this with higher taxes, with more corruption, with uh, poor quality services, water, electricity, garbage, etc. Uh, and this is very routine uh, for Lebanon, unfortunately. The new factor, though, is the external uh, direct meddling of Saudi Arabia uh, and Iran and now the United States in the uh, um, in the legislation to pressure Hezbollah. The external meddling is far more intense than it ever was before. And this mirrors what we've just been through in Syria in the last five years with direct military participation by foreign uh, countries. So the, uh, what's happening is different qualitatively to some extent, but uh, uh, quant quantitatively different. But qualitatively, this is Lebanon playing its role as a regional punching bag, shock absorber, and battlefield for the rivals uh, in the region and the power further afield. And uh, Joseph, so from what Rami is saying, it sounds as though it's almost business as usual for uh, Lebanon, unfortunately, insofar as the, the big players, i.e. Saudi Arabia and Iran, are likely to take out their grievances uh, on the battlefield, the battlefield being, being Lebanon and particularly Beirut. Well, without taking anything away from what Rami just said, uh, there is no doubt that outside interference has always defined Lebanese politics. But there is so much of that one can argue. I think that at the end of the day, the responsibility really lies on the Lebanese themselves. The fact that Lebanon has been a dysfunctional country is not Saudi Arabia's fault or Iran's fault or anybody else's fault. It is the Lebanese fault. The Lebanese have failed to actually create a nation state. What they have done is, as we've just heard, and I fully share with Rami's analysis, uh, corruption and all kinds of uh, agreements that have been uh, made over the years by the establishment in order to perpetuate themselves in power. But this is where this particular episode now has dramatically changed the situation. The balance that existed in Lebanon for the past year after the election of President Aoun to the presidency, which I remind you, occurred with the cooperation and the support of Prime Minister uh, Hariri, this balance of power now has collapsed 
The biggest loser in what has occurred yesterday was not Hariri's dismissal. It was President Aoun losing the balance of power that he built his entire presidency on. It remains to be determined how he will respond to this. And whoever next comes in next, whoever the new prime minister is, will not be able to bring back this balance of power that existed between the president on the one hand and the cabinet on the other. The, we, have, we have ahead of us some pretty tough periods of time, and we can easily blame outside uh, forces for interfering in Lebanon. But at the end of the day, the Lebanese must assume 100% of the responsibility. OK, and Mustafa, how is this being viewed in Tehran? Is this being viewed as as potentially a, a, a loss of territory, a loss of influence, because, of course, Hezbollah has been, as we've already said, has been uh, consolidating its power and influence in Lebanon of late. So is Iran concerned uh, that the backlash to this and now the ensuing power vacuum is likely to, to destabilise, if you like, the gains that have been recently made by Hezbollah and its allies? You know, the game, uh, uh, but we do respect to my colleagues in Washington and Beirut that I agree with them on a number of points. Uh, uh, that's exactly what the Saudis want. They have turned the table in, uh, you know, Lebanon and uh, in order to lay much pressure, economic and political pressure, as well as the pressures that come uh, with uh, uh, instability and insecurity, to lay all these pressure on the government, on the president, on the people, in order to come uh, to the conclusion that if they stand with Hezbollah, they would have to, you know, uh, uh, suffer more, uh, especially considering the United States sanctions, banking sanctions against Hezbollah, when a country is also, uh, as we all uh, witnessed last night, uh, uh, is confronting or, or is faced with uh, new military threats by Israel, Altogether, the sanctions, the military threats by Israel, as well as the uh, uh, political chaos that uh, the Saudis have steered in Lebanon since yesterday, they all uh, uh, are working as components of, uh, of one single scheme and plot in order to pressure the Lebanese people to come up with the, this conclusion that they need to force Hezbollah to grant some concessions to Saudi Arabia and its allies. And Rami... That's the way it's seen in Tehran. Uh, Rami, uh, let's look at this in, in the wider context now of, of the profound changes that are taking place in Saudi Arabia. How does this fit in to what seems to be a, a completely new vision emanating from Riyadh as to how Saudi sees itself and how it projects itself in the region? Well, I think there's several dimensions potentially to that. You know, Saudi Arabia today is like the Kremlin in the 1960s. You don't really know what's going on inside the institutions or the families that make power. Uh, but from what we can see, my assessment is that there are several dimensions. The first is that the, the Saudis, um, after really uh, making big mistakes in Qatar, uh, Syria, and Yemen, where their policies have really been failures to a large extent, they're looking for a win of some sort. Now, a win doesn't uh, necessarily have to be peaceful. A win could be creating instability and chaos in Lebanon and, and forcing new realities there, but it makes Saudi Arabia look tough. And this is one of the things that uh, the Saudis have been saying for three years or so now, that they are going to flex their muscles, take care of themselves, protect their national interests, and, and not rely on, on others. So that's one dimension. The second one is, of course, uh, Saudis have this uh, hysterical fear of, of Iran, uh, and whether it's justified or not, it is very intense, and they're doing anything they can in the region to try to weaken uh, Iran. And one way they think they can do this is by weakening Hezbollah or pressuring Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, so that's another dimension. The third one is that Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince and effectively the ruler of Saudi Arabia now, uh, is, is undertaking an incredible uh, set of measures, uh, arresting princes, senior princes and billionaire business people who have been pillars of the regime and others in Saudi Arabia and putting them under uh, house arrest, and this is to affirm not just his uh, incumbency, but that the new policies that he wants to 
um, implement in Saudi Arabia in economic, social, political fields uh, will all happen without any opposition or even any discussion uh, or criticism. The problem with this is that these have all been tried before in Lebanon by various people um, to weaken Hezbollah, to create a, a bit of chaos, to weaken the links with Syria and Iran, and they've never succeeded. They've, they've always failed, and this is the great dilemma that faces anybody who tries to interfere in Lebanon. So Lebanon today is not like Lebanon of 1975 or 1995. It's a com very different country with a very powerful group called Hezbollah with external links that has been able to maintain its strength and be directly incorporated into the governing uh, structure. So it's a big challenge for Saudi Arabia to find foreign policy tools that are effective rather than uh, inept as they have been in the, in the last 10 or 15 years or so. And Mustafa, a very, very strong and empowered Hezbollah, of course, attracts the, the uh, attention of Israel as well, which has been making some bellicose noises uh, in recent months. With a more muscular Saudi Arabia, apparently more willing uh, to, to take military action, um, does Iran feel that it would meet that head-on? Would it meet that challenge head-on? Or is there a, a possibility that there is another forum, another forum through which dialogue perhaps could be fostered? Well, um, Iran um, so far doesn't believe that these military threats by Israel or by uh, Saudi Arabia would come into action. As a matter of fact, this is a psychological warfare uh, launched against Hezbollah and the Lebanese altogether. Uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, there are reports coming out uh, saying that Saad Hariri, uh, when he was in uh, Riyadh and took the trip to uh, Beirut, he was conveying a message from Saudi Arabia to a uh, meeting with the uh, top advisor of Iranian Supreme Leader, Dr. Velayati, uh, asking him, uh, on behalf of the Saudis to give up uh, Iran's uh, political support for Yemen if uh, they want to go ahead with uh, you know their role in the region uh, and uh, give some parts uh, uh, b give back some part of their role in Syria in the future of Syria back to the Saudi Arabia uh, the, to the Saudis and apparently their response has been tough saying that Iran would not relinquish its support for uh, the Yemenis, and neither for Hezbollah, Iraq, or Syria. And uh, uh, Saudi Arabia should be realistic and pragmatic and come forward uh, for uh, real peace talks, not uh, you know, uh, the talks that it intends uh, uh, just to go on to uh, spread its hegemony or to reclaim its lost role in the region. So that's the current condition uh, for the time being uh, Tehran doesn't believe that there is going to be any, uh, you know, uh, military conflict, but uh, there is no need for Tehran's meddling. Uh, all Israeli, you know, uh, uh, circles, military reports and experts have reiterated that Hezbollah has grown 10 times more powerful than it was in 2006 when it forced the uh, Israelis out of the country after three th uh, 33 days of war. And uh, uh, the Israelis have estimated that Hezbollah has over 100,000 missiles that could rain down on Israel if uh, any kind of clash arises or starts against them. So uh, the estimates here in Tehran show that uh, the Israelis are not at all willing to uh, start any kind of conflict with Hezbollah, especially considering that a foreign invasion would uh, unite the Lebanese around Hezbollah again. And uh, Joseph, so uh, Mustafa the, uh, tells us that the view from Tehran is that this is uh, a psychological warfare, that there doesn't seem to be a real uh, a possibility of a military escalation, a military confrontation between these powers. Is that how it feels in Lebanon today? No, quite actually, it feels very bad. Uh, I think that hyperbole aside, uh, no one really knows uh, exactly what's going on behind the scenes, whether or not... Uh, this party or that party is going to get involved in uh, escalating this. There are fundamental differences that need to be uh, focused on between Lebanese parties themselves. Saad Hariri, as prime minister, was one of the most accommodating individuals in the political system of isn't Lebanon. Isn't and that what Saudi didn't like? Wasn't, wasn't it that accommodating uh, nature that, uh, that got him into trouble with Riyadh? It's possible that the Saudis did not like that, but I'm 
uh, first talking about the, the Lebanese scene itself. Saad Hariri was trying as much as possible to accommodate all parties. And Hezbollah is a genuine political part of the country. But there is a difference, as I said just a moment ago, between what Hezbollah does inside Lebanon and what Hezbollah does by itself, by its own volition, without the agreement of the Lebanese government, which means the Lebanese people, with its foreign interventions, whether it's in Syria or elsewhere. This is the fundamental dispute. This is the weakness of Hezbollah that no one can really push under the rug. Hezbollah is part of the Lebanese political establishment. It is not an alien part of the country, but it must submit to the will of the legitimate institutions of the country. And we have a constitutional process that needs to be taken into account. And when the government decides that there's going to be a policy of non-interference in Syria or elsewhere, everyone must accept to it. Hezbollah has not accepted this. Hariri tried to accommodate. It didn't work. Now, the onus really is not about Hariri anymore. It's really what President Aoun is going to do. And we will see whether he is made uh, whether he has the metal to actually be able to save his presidency, because as far as I can see, his presidency is finished. And uh, Rami, does uh, saving President Aoun's presidency entail uh, finding a new prime minister and finding one quickly? Well, uh, that's his job. It's his responsibility. He has a lot of extra uh, weight on his shoulders now to step up. He's a forceful, determined fellow, um, and he will probably be more effective in trying to find and name a prime minister and get parliamentary approval for that than previous presidents uh, have been. But as we've just heard, there are really serious internal issues in Lebanon, particularly about the role of Hezbollah internally and externally, that have never been addressed, never been seriously uh, grappled with. And the Lebanese have been unable to do this. And the reason Hezbollah has become so strong and so powerful is because the Lebanese state was not able to do what it's supposed to do, to protect its citizens from Israeli occupation and raids, to provide services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, there's a chicken and egg situation here that until the Lebanese government government can really be strong enough to serve all of its citizens, uh, Hezbollah feels that it has to uh, play that role. But there are several, there's just one or two other things I just want to mention quickly. It's been very clear in Lebanon for about the last eight, ten years that there will not be an internal civil war unless it is intentionally sparked from outside. The Lebanese have had many opportunities to resume fighting and they've always resisted it in, in, in the last, in recent years because they understand that they had their civil war, everybody lost and they're not going to do it again. The second critical point is that unlike in previous years, there is no single powerful external patron that is either responsible for Lebanon or will come in and save it now as there had been historically before. You had the French, you had the Americans, you had the Saudis, you uh, others, Iranians stepped in at some point for partial reasons, uh, but there isn't a single, and Syria, of course, was running the country for 15 years, there isn't a single external powerful patron now that's going to step in, and most of the world, frankly, has pretty much gotten tired of Lebanon and its internal uh, squabbles, uh, so the Lebanese are facing a really tough situation right, now, and they right. really have we're, we're to running, we're somehow running out of time, pick Rami, up so their system. So I have to jump in and very quickly, Mustafa, can I ask you whether Iran is prepared to exert some influence over Hezbollah because it seems the size and power of Hezbollah is critical to the, the well-being of Lebanon as an independent state. Can you be very quick, please? Oh, no. Uh, as said Hassan Nasrullah, the Hezbollah leader, uh, stated a few times very recently, Iran aids Hezbollah, sends economic aids and other aids, but uh, it never orders Hezbollah. That's what said Hassan Nasrullah, the Hezbollah leader, stressed. Iran never, uh, you know, uses Hezbollah as a puppet or it never orders the group to do this or that. This is Hezbollah that is, you know, playing in there. Uh, as a matter of fact, Hezbollah leader declared uh, very recently that it was him and his group that came to Tehran and asked the Iranian leader to start the uh, fight, uh, the, the fight against uh, the terrorist groups in Syria. So they convinced the Iranian leader to uh, go to Syria. Okay. That's Mustafa, the fact today. I have to, Iran I have is to, not. I have to jump in Iran now. Iran wants an independent and united Lebanon. I have to interrupt, and thank you very much indeed. Okay. Joseph Kasichian, thank you.
Mustafa Koshesem, thank you very much. And Rami Khoury, as always, thank you very much indeed. Really interesting conversation. Thanks a lot. Now, if you want to see the programme again, you can see it online. Aljazeera.com is our website. If you want more discussion, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. There's always the Twitter sphere as well. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Martine Dennis from the whole team here in Doha. It's bye for now. <laughs>